Hello and welcome to RV Talk Radio. Join us here at each show where we visit RV products and services and RV tips, RV living, and RV lifestyles. So relax, grab a cup of coffee, let's talk about RVs. Well, hello everybody once again on episode 42 of RV Talk Radio. Welcome. We have an interesting show. We're going to talk about the dark side of RV. Well, it's not really the dark side, but uh, we're going to talk about the the negative sides of RVing and full-time RV lifestyle. And this isn't to be negative. It's just to kind of balance things out. We're always saying how happy-go-lucky we are and all that stuff. But uh, after seeing a couple of shows, it's like, well, um, that talked about things that aren't so good. We have uh, our own list. (laughs) and uh, We thought, well, today we're going to devote the show to things you may not have thought about or what we'll call the dark side side of RV. Well, I'm amazed of actually how long my list is. And so a lot of people say, if you're on an RV, you do a pros and a con list and kind of compare them and see if you can live with it stuff. But um, as I was brainstorming, it's like, (laughs) I've got like 30 things there. And uh, so I'm kind of like, why do I still like this? (laughs) uh, These are just things that are part of RVing when you live in your RV full time. I don't think much of it's going to be different if you're in a motorhome, a fifth wheel, a trailer, or a van, or a camper. I think a lot of these things are consistent. And so uh, let's uh, start going through the list and uh, kind of discuss to you at least some of the things that we are inconvenienced with or find is a little bit negative in the... RV lifestyle. So here we go. Starting number one on my list, and these aren't really in any special order, is propane. Um, I have, I'm just going to give you an example of one seven gallon propane tank in cost. Typically, when we're in the Seattle area, it would cost me about $20, $21 to fill one of those tanks. And then when we're in Central Oregon, uh, there were several places where I was getting uh, propane as low as a dollar to a dollar twenty-five, and it cost me eight dollars to fill my tank. And now uh, we're in Arizona, so we're not really going through much propane, but I wanted to have one of my propane tanks full. And my other one's got maybe a gallon or two in it that we've just been using for cooking and stuff, but we're not running the heater at all. And I went over to this one place. Um, it's on an Indian reservation. It's a Chevron. I just went to the propane thing. I mean, I figured it could be as high as 20 bucks. Turned out it was four dollars a gallon, so it cost me like thirty-five dollars to fill one seven-gallon propane. Now that was my fault. I didn't ask ahead of time. But uh, propane is all over the place, and it's almost like a a gimmick. Uh, if you're in the wrong place, where maybe uh, the little town only has one or two places to get propane, they're gonna gouge you. So that was one of my pet peeves about. Uh, propane co- uh, prices and you don't see that big a very when it comes to regular gasoline unless you're in a real tourist town but boy it's just all over the place so watch your propane costs or, or prices and of course what I don't like in the winter <laughs> especially if you're boondocking and don't have electric uh, and you're uh, uh, we've used up to a, a tank almost a tank a day just to maintain heat and running a generator and our generator is a propane generator and when we're boondocking we're almost going through a tank seven gallons a, uh, about six gallons a day 
uh, just keeping things heated and all that. So that was one of my pet peeves. One of the other things that come up all the time is tank maintenance. So whether you're well, boondocking, it's a little it's worse than an RV being in an RV park. At least you can dump right at your sp space if they have a dump area. But if you're not and you need to empty your tanks, you have two choices. You either move the rig to a pl dump station or you get a mobile um, uh, imp uh, plastic tank that you can get in all different sizes that you can dump your stuff into and then haul it by hand or on the back of your hitch in a truck uh, and to the dump area in the RV park if you don't have a septic hookup uh, at your place. So uh, tank maintenance is an ongoing thing even when you're connected. Uh, uh, I don't leave our valves open so the tanks will accumulate and sometimes that's nice because if you're dumping your black tanks after you're done doing that then you dump uh, empty your gray tanks and that kind of flushes out the the hose and gets the the black <laughs> waste uh, at least washed out of the hose a little bit because that is typically s soapy water and, and uh, helps uh, maintain the hose a little bit so uh, I think checking tanks is almost every day the other thing we do constantly is we're flushing our black tank because uh, things build up all the time in a black tank the problem with a black tank and if you're not moving is you tend to get kind of a <laughs> sorry but pile up and since the RV is not moving it's not kind of jockeying things around and sushing it up and making it easy to dump out so I, probably every two or three days uh, I do what's called a flesh out where you uh, usually in our rig we have a rig where you can a part where you can run water into the tank and we I let it fill as high as I can flush it and do that process three four or five times to constantly uh, keep things <laughs> moist and breaking down and, and make sure I'm not getting too much toilet paper build up and of course you want to make sure you only use like a one ply uh, septic tank um, approved kind of toilet paper that breaks down uh, some of this three cushion charming kind of stuff uh, can really play havoc on your tank so Maintaining tanks is something that's not the funnest thing in the world. The other thing I found is slides. Um, slides have to be watched. Slides have openings sometimes. You got to make sure critters don't get through um, because they move in and out and get kind of uh, movement on them. The seals around the edging where they're attached and things like that, you may have to touch up, uh, making sure you don't have water leaks. Uh, they can, um, you know, um, and, and you have problems whether it's sunshine or whether it's raining all the time and snow could play havoc on them too so slide maintenance is something that you got to go up check those things out all the time um, uh, silicone them when you can or use your uh, die core or whatever you or tape them um, trying to make sure that they're prepared for almost any type of weather of course really hot weather you got issues of breaking down your sealants and also UV protection and things like that so that's another thing is this a constant thing you want to check and, and with my slides I also make sure I I spray bug spray in the corners and stuff like that um, just to make sure we don't get critters sneaking in and I don't care if you got an old rig or a new rig that's an issue so uh, if you if you've ever had a chance to own a house or rent a house, uh, even some town houses have like little yards and stuff, the one thing you kind of miss the most with your pets, especially if you have a dog, is uh, taking them outside all the time. When Cinder's great, she communicates well with us. Her timing is always bad, <laughs> it seems like. But, you know, um, most RV parks you go to, they need to be on a leash. Um, we always try to make sure we go to a place that has a dog park uh, that they've created or a fenced off area. So Cinder has a pretty good spot here where we can go into a fenced area, get her off the leash, let her run, throw a toy for her, and try to burn her out. And of course, it's warmer here, so she burns out faster. Uh, we also keep a little swimming pool for her, um, just one of those plastic ones you can get for like 10 bucks from Target. 
And um, when she plays and gets, and it's, you know, 80, 90 degrees here in Arizona, um, we'll play with her. She'll get very warm. Uh, we go straight to the pool, and she just lays down in it and just goes, oh. <laughs> so, but um, it's kind of a pain because you got to be with your pet. You can't let them run free. Even if you're boondocking, you got to be careful of uh, where you're at. If you're way up north, you got critters up there that could hurt your pets. Uh, you're down here in the south, we get the same problem with critters and uh, 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 rattlesnakes and things like that. So we just don't let cinder run free. Uh, it's a shame. Uh, we, When we're up in the northwest, we could do that a little more because there's not as many critters to harm her. And so anyway, uh, taking care of pets can be kind of tough. Uh, a cat too. Some people let their cats roam around their backyard or something. Around here, you got to make sure that your pet is kind of trained to be on a harness, at least with a cat. And so we do let our cat come outside. Uh, we'll spend an hour or two just relaxing outside and let the animals are still on leashes, but still roam around at least our our space a little bit just to get them out of the RV. One of the next things I'd like to bring up is cooling or heating. It seems like there's always just I don't know it doesn't seem like there's always that perfect day there's always trying to balance out um, cooling so what we did it for down here in Arizona since we're gonna be here during the hot summer months <laughs> we're gonna talk about hot we actually added a third air conditioner so we have two air conditioners on our roof and they're running just fine but I don't want to work them to death so I purchased a Honeywell uh, portable uh, air conditioner uh, that stands upright and actually have to run a hose out one of the windows and it's in our living room and the purpose for that is to take the pressure off of the big units on the top of the RV um, so we're able to keep it quite cool in here and we want to be able to keep it pretty cool at nighttime so we can sleep because it's kind of uh, uh, Sherry and I like a, I guess because we're from the Northwest but we like it kind of cool and so uh, that's the one thing we've had to deal with with keeping things cool and of course if you're uh, boondocking uh, the portable will be kind of useless to you because uh, you just can't run the amperage that you want unless you get your generator on so if I fired up our generator we could run actually uh, we've had both of our AC units on before but I haven't put three of them on I don't think my generator can handle that but um, uh, to have them on all day long in your boondocking uh, is probably not a practical thing. And then there's the other extreme of cold weather. We're trying to keep things um, warm in here. Propane will kill you if you just depend on your propane heater. So having good uh, electric heaters is nice to have too. So we also have in our Montana one of those uh, kind of fake fireplaces and they're also heaters too and it actually does really well about keeping our, our living room warm and then we have like a small low wattage kind of a heater that we keep up in a, our bedroom if we need it um, so we can reduce the usage of the furnace so we're not burning through so much propane so it's constantly a battle it's constantly a balance and of course it depends on what region you're in and and what season of the year that you're in depending where you live so heating and cooling definitely a issue the next fun subject is showers now you can uh, uh, argue uh, you know most of the RV parks at least have um, bath houses or showers and stuff like that and and some of them are kept up really well and some of them are terrible we were in one place that had more critters in it than I could stand to even go, go in and just use it for regular purposes let alone take a shower in it uh, so they're they vary from RV park to RV park but we tend to actually use our own shower because we know it's clean it's kept up uh, but the drawback is they're small and if you haven't noticed I'm not exactly the smallest guy in the world but um, and in fact you don't get get that chance to take really long showers I think we have a 12 gallon tank a hot water heater so actually we can take up to 10 minute showers if we really wanted to but you also gotta remember you're filling your grade tank at the same time so because we use our shower daily uh, in the RV 
Um, we also have to empty our gray tank at least every other day. Uh, Sherry takes a shower every day. I do too. I tend to do it in the evening. She's in the mornings. And uh, so you, you go through a lot of water. Now, if you're boondocking, uh, you can still do showers in your own rig. But remember, you're limited on your water. So you want to do what they call the Navy shower, where you just spray on the water, scrub, sh turn off the water, scrub up, and then shut, turn on the water and rinse off and reduce the usage of your water because you're limited. But anyway, showers uh, can... Uh, and, and the other thing is pretty much non-existent is a bathtub. Um, I do miss a bathtub once in a while just to kick back, <laughs> take a beer with you, relax in a nice hot bath, and especially if you're sore from doing some yard work or something. Um, that's just not going to happen. I guess the best next best thing to that is uh, a lot of places have hot tubs and you can go relax with your sore muscles. But anyway, so showers, uh, you got to learn how the do that a little differently but there's no lack of them but it, it definitely varies from RV park to RV park if you're a person that uh, isn't the best about putting things away when you're done with them RV life is not for you uh, storage is always an issue and organization is an issue and I've seen especially since people do a lot of videos of their RVs seen pretty um, trashed uh, <laughs> RVs, uh, clothes laying everywhere, all that kind of dishes not done. And I can guarantee you, especially with Sherry, she's very detail oriented, cannot stand things to be messy. And so uh, I'm probably more lenient in that area, but I, since I've chose this lifestyle, I, I have to be reminded by Sherry a lot, put things back when I'm done with them. Uh, that's the first thing. And just don't, you know, when it comes to clothing, um, if they're dirty, put them in a hamper. Uh, don't leave things around. Uh, it really gets bad with us when we got all of our cameras and editing going on. Uh, if I don't put things away after I'm done, uh, if I do green screen, I've got to, you know, pull out the green screen, set it up. When I'm all done, put everything away. And if I'm using tripods and lights and things like that. And then, of course, uh, we've got all the different editing and cameras where we're downloading files and all that kind of stuff. I've got to make sure that when I'm done, I put them away, get them out of the way. Um, and I neglect it sometimes, And uh, but um, I guess we get a little more anal about it as far as uh, uh, as time goes on. It was like, geez, I just need to make sure I put this stuff away. And so storage, putting things back where you got them, uh, finding good place to put your stuff. Uh, Sherry and I don't feel so much that we don't have the storage. The Montana is really good for lots of storage. The harder part is when you take it out, put it back. So if you're not one of those people that can't uh, finish a project, put everything away before you do your next project, then uh, RV life is definitely not for you. Now talking about computers and hardware. Now, Sherry and I probably are exception to the rule because we have a lot of it. But if you're a person that can just work on a laptop and you just have a mouse and a mouse pad, um, then uh, this isn't that big an issue. But if you ever see little glimpses of our place, we also have a podcast, uh, microphone um, assembly system on our uh, dining room table. We have mixers, tons of cameras all the different adapters. We also have um, uh, a router that we have going here that um, runs our uh, IP phone. And of course we have Wi-Fi Ranger and we have a wireless printer and, and uh, tons of equipment and supporting equipment for our hardware and software. So that can get a little um, annoying and of course, as Sherry and I both have our own laptops, so that's uh, um, she's got a place that she likes to keep hers going. I like to keep mine going. We let our run, uh, laptops run 24/7. Um, it gets uh, a little bit crowded sometimes, so you need to make sure that you got an RV that can support whatever you're doing. If you're just your average Joe with a computer, not that big a deal. You can, um, but uh, if you're going to 
start a blog or maybe start doing videos and stuff like that you also need to make sure that you've got a good workplace in your RV that you can keep your equipment up and running otherwise then you really got to be anal you know, about putting it away every time you use it and, and uh, uh, with the podcasts and the microphone system we use and stuff like that it's just not practical to keep breaking it down and putting it up and breaking it down and putting it up so uh, you really need to think over what your electronic uses are going to be and of course you've got all the other things like chargers for your batteries and chargers for your cell phone batteries and um, it just goes on and on it just depends on how involved you are with electronics so something to consider and me actually if you're a gamer um, this isn't the best lifestyle either because it's hard to get good internet so you just need to weigh it and figure it out if this is gonna work for you the dark side, the dark side of side. RV well I just uh, touched on one of the biggest subjects that could be a problem for you is the internet so I'm not gonna go into that too deeply other than it can be quite frustrating depending where you're at uh, depending what RV park you're at um, so you know there's certain things you want to make sure you have um, some kind of uh, internet extender because some RV parks only have internet in their community center and uh, since we have Wi-Fi Ranger on the top of our roof uh, typically we can tap into those systems from a distance uh, most probably the most dependable internet you can get is a cell phone internet hotspot and but there is places where you can't get a cell phone signal and that's useless to you we typically uh, actually we're at a place where we can get a hard line uh, connected to us which was really nice for a dollar a day and so because of the type of work sharing I do uh, it's worth that dollar a day uh, that's a lot cheaper than I think we pay hundred and ten dollars just for a hotspot uh, for our cell phone that's not counting the whole cell phone bill uh, one thing you can probably guarantee that if you have to have internet and hotspot and things like that you're going to be paying about 300 350 dollars for your cell phone bill uh, we have three phones though but uh, you can if you didn't have that three phones you could probably knock 50 bucks off of that but um, what a racket uh, the cell phone business that just gets your um, one of these days we'll do a uh, serious talk about cell phones and wireless but uh, uh, I'm not going to go into that in detail on this particular show but internet is hit and miss everywhere uh, so Sherry and I've been pretty fortunate uh, once in a while I've actually ran out of uh, bandwidth uh, you know uh, I, my hotspot only has 30 gigs so I've pushed it and um, ran out of bandwidth for a couple, like a week or so, and ended up having to go to someone's house so I could upload videos and things. So, internet, and if you're a gamer, uh, good luck to you. That's all I can say. So, internet, definitely a problem in the RV lifestyle. This is probably the biggest problem right now and it's all over the board and we just did a couple videos asking people to give us feedback on the subject and it really comes down to health care it's all over the place and I'm not an expert in health care all I can talk about is the issues that Sherry and I have so I just you know, retired and let, unfortunately the company I had didn't have a retirement insurance till um, so basically we're out of luck until we get into our what 65 for Medicare we have 10 years for the wait. So health care is an issue. And then because Sherry and I have very well-paying jobs, and um, not me so, um, so much anymore because I'm on a pension, Sherry still makes a very good income. And so our income level uh, hurts us as far as you want to talk about this Obamacare stuff. It's not practical for Sherry and I at all. So right now she's working as we're kind of debating how to deal with that issue um, at this younger age uh, we have insurance through her work but we you know you only live once so we also kind of want to hit the road and do a couple of adventures in our lives while we still can so how are we going to do that and also have the health care 
Now, other folks have been, you know, they've served the military and they deserve it, uh, have their uh, military um, veterans um, health care support. And um, there's other exceptions where some people have got a discounted insurance from retirement. And that's um, and that's great. And I, I just that isn't how the cards got dealt to Sherry and I. So how do we deal with this insurance thing? And, and, and you probably heard us hinting that we're actually looking at maybe a over the border type of uh, lifestyle in the future that uh, will allow us to afford insurance through places like Mexico and stuff like that. They have uh, universal programs that even support people that are outside of the country. Uh, you still have to pay for it, but it's a reasonable cost. Uh, there's, uh, uh, but you know, Sherry and I will probably, when we travel, we'd wait till the first of the year, and then if she left her job, we could show a very low income for that year, and uh, um, actually maybe uh, uh, be able to get a, a more affordable health care while we're doing some special trip for that particular year. We don't know. It's just brainstorming. Healthcare is definitely an issue. Uh, I'm sure if you're younger, you probably don't think about it as much. Uh, but if you're younger and have kids, you probably think about it a lot because they're going in and out of um, doctors all the time. So real big downfall. And of course, it's not necessarily, you don't have to necessarily be an RVer to have this particular problem. But it is a um, ball and chain as far as uh, if you want to travel full time, of course, you have to deal with the different states. And uh, even if you had health care, may not be applicable to other states. So you really got to do your homework. And all I can say is we love to hear the feedback from uh, people that have found some solutions. So health care, definitely a problem. If you've been a person or a couple or family that's lived in one particular region most of your lives, which is not unusual. Uh, Sherry and I lived in Washington. We pretty much were in Washington a lot, most of our lives. So you deal with the weather, the regions area. up there. It's rain and cold weather and gray clouds. But if you're going to be an RVer, you need to start being one open-minded. One is uh, proactive to understand the weather in the different states and in the different regions. So uh, if you don't like wind gusts and if you don't like hail and if you don't like tornadoes and you don't like uh, areas that might have hurricanes, uh, if you don't want to deal with that kind of stuff, um, then stay put. Uh, or you're already in a place that has that stuff and you're just like, so big deal. Uh, the big part is uh, is if you're going to be an RVer and move to the different regions, you need to accept and understand and educate yourself about those regions. Um, you have to deal with their weather. You have to deal with their traffic. You have to deal with the different types of stores. Like if you're in Phoenix, do you know they don't have street signs like? If you're looking for a Safeway or you're looking for a, a, a grocery store, you may not have one when you're at, um, and you're driving through town, you don't see the signs out in the road like you do, say, up in Washington State. Um, they have ordinances where their sign usage is uh, uh, at a minimal. So uh, the little complexes you go to, you literally have to drive into the complexes to find out what's in there. Uh, because you don't have all these uh, ign uh, annoying uh, uh, street signs like we're used to like when we're in Washington. So there's a pro and con to that. One is the city looks so much better and so much cleaner without all these people comp competing for their signage. Uh, but at the same time, it's really hard to see uh, unless you have a passenger in a car that can look into the complex as you're driving by. Uh, uh, getting used to the region of where the stores are, where to get haircuts, where to get certain things. Uh, and of course, when you're in different regions, you have also different wildlife, which also deal with uh, your RV and your pets. Uh, if you know, you could go Alaska and deal with bears and eagles uh, that can take out your do little dog or cat, um, or yourself. 
Or you can be down here in Arizona and deal with rattlesnakes and some of their cr uh, uh, critters too. So it's different. I hear Alabama has a lot of problems with um, ladybugs. So getting educated but being willing to deal with the different regions issues uh, and it also includes you know like snow um, dust storms things like that uh, do you have the equipment and do you have the uh, knowledgeability to deal with those kind of issues when they come along something you need to consider when you're becoming an RVer the dark side, the dark side of RV. well unlike well just like owning a house, uh, having an RV, they're going to break. Now, a lot of times when you're a house, sometimes you can per postpone things a little bit, depending on what the uh, issue is. Well, an RV can't necessarily, um, you know, if your heating's not working, it, you only have one heater and that, it could be a problem. Or if your cooling system doesn't work or air conditioners are broke down or, or a truck breaks down or truck you know is our transportation and it's also what hauls our rig important that you keep that stuff going so uh, uh, breakdowns and equipment um, maintenance are a high priority when they happen or come um, or and proactive maintenance will help at least reduce that a little and putting off changing your oil is not a good excuse putting off fixing a slide putting off uh, some something that breaks in an RV just does isn't a good idea uh, in a house sometimes you can get away with it and buy yourself some time to save money or whatever so um, I don't care if you're in cold temperatures warm temperatures you got things like batteries and engines and appliances that have to be running and keep going and so if you're not a uh, if you get the budget to have people fix it for you, great. But if you're not a person that um, likes to tinker and learn how to fix things, uh, RVing can be a tough life for you. Uh, unless you really have the bucks where you can just keep calling in a maintenance guy. But uh, sooner or later, you've got to learn how to check your batteries. You know, sooner or later, you're going to have to get on the roof. Uh, sooner or later, you got to fix a doorknob or a, a leaky pipe. And, and sometimes... Uh, you know, if if that's not the kind of thing you like to do, then maybe uh, RVing is not the life for you either. So do realize that just because, I mean, if you think you're mechanically inclined and, but lack doing a lot of things, uh, let's say when you're in an RV, you'll be forced into it and you'll learn really quick. And what's really good about the modern RVer is, of course, you can go on YouTube and learn how to do almost anything. Uh, from sealing a roof to fixing a carpet or fixing an appliance or fixing your refrigerator. Uh, there's a lot of things that can help you fix it yourself and save yourself some money. But you got to be willing to do it. Moving on to my long, long list here, which, like I said, I didn't think it'd be so long, but as you start brainstorming about this stuff, going, yeah, there's a lot of things you need to consider if you're going to be an RVer. So let's talk about RV parks and resorts. Um, probably the big thing that usually comes up right away is cost. Well, that's all over the place. <laughs> I don't know what to say. And yes, I'm drinking coffee when we're talking about this. So uh, RV parks and resorts. Um, RV resort tends to be a place that has a little bit more amenities, especially for people that use RV parks. Uh, with their children and have swimming pools and basketball courts and things to keep the kids busy. Uh, it's more of an entertainment type of thing. Uh, like the Oasis RV Resort in Las Vegas. Uh, very expensive, but has so many amenities. It's just uh, amazing and it works. You know, they have a large staff. and they, So you're going to be paying uh, nine, $900 a month easy there. And the, per day, I, I don't remember what those numbers are. Uh, you can get on RV parks where I've been at a KOA once, uh, Kent, Washington, that was right next to Boeing, and I, apparently a lot of professionals that use it, they charge $75 a day, and I couldn't believe it, and I was stuck, and actually had to pay that. Um, and your monthly cost can be all over the place, uh, depending on what location that RV park's at. Uh, I've, 
you know, if you're just using it for business, you can usually get in the outskirts of places and get a reasonable monthly fees. Uh, where they really gouge you is the overnighter. If you're coming in overnight, they're going to pay, you know, you're going to be paying their $30, $40, $50 a night fees uh, just because they got gotcha. you. Um, but typically those same places can actually have really good deals on monthly uh, costs. So that's one of the main things. Um, of course, when you're in an RV, you, I, I'm, I was going to talk about this later, but you got to remember, if you don't like this at all, you don't own anything other than your RV. The space is kind of yours to use the way you want, but you got to follow the park rules. Um, you could get a neighbor. Like, there's a big difference between, say, people that full-time and, say, a weekend warrior. They're out to have a really fun weekend, and they may have a group of RVers, and they're outside um, laughing and giggling, and, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, but they could be loud, um, and, of course, on a, you know, they'll come in on a Friday night and bail out on a Sunday or Monday if they had a three-day weekend or not. And, uh, uh, you know, you have to be patient. Then there's the ultimately bad neighbor, which luckily Sherry and I really have not had one, but I've heard horror stories. Uh, you can get some creepy guys or get some, um, um, you know, rabble rousers, I'll call them. Uh, it could really make life miserable for you uh, while they're there. Uh, typically, um, you have to evaluate. If they're only there for a couple of days, you just tolerate it. Or, you know, if it's so bad, remember, you're on wheels. You can roll anytime you want. Uh, you may take a hit uh, financially a little bit because you may have paid for the month or something. But if it's just that bad, um, you know, move. But um, uh, typically, if you really do have a problem, you know, the best thing to do is go to the office and let them handle it, not you. And uh, so I guess that's the big thing is just remember... You're at the mercy of the RV park. They're all a little different. I wish I could say they're all consistent, but they're not. Uh, even part of the Thousand Trails Network, every RV park feels different. Um, and then there's the difference of a newer RV park and older RV parks. You have to watch out for your electrical outlets. You got um, They may not support um, uh, their 50 amp service. Or, uh, you may not be able to get 50 amp service, maybe only 30. And in some rare cases, only 20. And then not all of the parks have septic hookup at all the places either. So that's all over the place. And so you got to be willing to, one, is you should call ahead and make sure that if there's a particular amenity you want and must have, um, you should be able to get it. But it may not be at the park that you're looking at. Uh, you need to shop around, um, but sometimes you're stuck, and so you, you got to be flexible in this lifestyle. And um, if you're not, and you think it's just got to be a certain way all the time, you're going to be disappointed. And, and like I said, RVing may not be for you. The other thing I want to bring up about RV parks and resorts is memberships. And, you know, some of those memberships are a good chunk of change. And... Uh, if you use them right, they typically can work out all right for you. But, uh, for example, like the Thousand Trails that we use, uh, we didn't get the heavy-duty membership because, and, we, and uh, we weren't sure if it really would work that well for us. And typically, it worked really well for us in the northwest, but as soon as we got down south, where there was very little um, Thousand Trails, it was absolutely useless to us. We tried to get in 1,000 uh, trail thousand trails down here in Arizona and Cottonwood and we couldn't even get our name on a list for months ahead of time because it was just a real popular place so just because you have a membership doesn't mean you're invincible of not being able to find a RV park or save money so uh, uh, be careful on these membership things uh, to use them takes in some cases, good planning to be spontaneous like Sherry and I, it could be a problem. And then we've also found in like some of the Thousand Trails, you can't necessarily get the kind of hookups you want. Uh, they'll get you in, but you may be boondocking on their property. And, and uh, you know, they typically will have a dump that you can relieve your tanks and stuff. But 
uh, it happens. And so, I don't know, I just want to make sure that if you think that's going to make you invincible in some of these RV parks, not necessarily true. Do your homework. Talk to other people. Get on the Internet. There's lots of stories. There's lots of education about all the different memberships out there. Sherry and I are only aware of uh, Cam Resorts and, and Thousand Trails. And uh, there's a lot of positive, but there's also the dark side. <laughs> Let's change the subject a little bit to keeping your RV clean. <laughs> Alrighty, so fun, fun stuff. So if you're going to be an RV traveler, you're going to deal with the different regions. Uh, in Washington State, let's say, or maybe you're going to Canada or Alaska, you're going to deal with rain and mud. Um, uh, soft dirt, pine needles. Oh, the pine needles are... A constant battle uh, you come down south uh, depending on the weather and things like that you're gonna deal with dust <laughs> lots of dust and Central Oregon too, dust um, then you got the issue do you have allergies and things like that so um, and then moisture moisture in different regions is higher you know humidity all that stuff so just to give you an example in our RV we have an air purifier uh, to help us keep the because uh, we have pets too um, to get the airborne stuff that gets kicked up when you're walking around from the pets or the dust or um, uh, of course you have pollen. The other thing is having a uh, humidifier uh, to dehumidifier I should say uh, to help. Uh, we really had problems with moisture up in Washington and Oregon uh, especially being along the coast. Uh, gosh the windows constantly had water on them and stuff and we finally bought a little dehumidifier which um, definitely helps um, but you got to be uh, willing to deal with the fact that and, and of course you get in certain areas like uh, in central Oregon we had a place where it had a lot of red rock and stuff when we you, they get caught in your shoes and you'd be tra tra tracking uh, not only just dirt or dust but you'd be tracking in small pieces of rocks uh, so you're constantly cleaning and then, of course, uh, depending on regions, dust is really an issue. And it gets on your computers, it gets on your television, on your counters, and it's a constant battle. So having an air purifier help that a little bit, but uh, you're going to be constantly cleaning. And, uh, uh, of course, you know, we've got pets, too, that come in and out. They're bringing in dirt and uh, stuff. And then if you're going to have pets, of course, you've got fur. So uh, protecting your... Uh, furniture and appliances and electronics um, you need to uh, clean a lot and if you don't uh, you'll start noticing it real well and so will people that come into your RV going oh have they ever cleaned this thing and cleaning your windows and, and, and of course when you're driving and all the different weathers your outside windows get trashed so um, and then of course your RV itself uh, needs a bath once in a while and uh, we typically hire someone to do that uh, just getting where i'm just not as comfortable climbing up on the roof and stuff like that so i'll hire some young um, young buck to uh, wash our rig for 80 to 100 bucks uh, it could be hiring that in some cases too and uh if your rig's kind of been out there for a while wouldn't hurt to get a new wax job uh, cleaning your tires and and and, and, and keeping uh, all the hardware cleaned up is uh, and greased up too is important but uh, cleaning is a constant battle uh, and I was going to talk about this later but I'll talk about it now dishes Sherry goes I swear I'm just doing dishes all the time and, and she doesn't mind doing dishes as long as I dry I hate doing dishes and she hates to dry but it, so she's really good about that so when she's working though I've you know she's asked to you know I need you to support things a little bit uh, while I'm gone it's like so I try to after my lunch and all that stuff I try to at least have my dishes all done and cleaned up uh, so when we get home we just can make a mess of making dinner and stuff so dishes are ongoing and um, some RVs do have some dishwashers but you're limited on that too just like a washer and dryer um, and I haven't really even talked about that yet but washer and dryer to have one is one is you use a lot of water but the other thing is they also when you're using a washer and dryer can fill up your tanks fast too so you have to be careful in that area um, 
we actually had a catastrophe once in our motor home back in 2007. Sherry was running a little washer and dryer, and the grade tank was still closed, and the water came up in the shower, which was fine, but um, the bad part was I was stirring my guitar in there. <laughs> so lucky it really didn't hurt the guitar, but uh, boy, it was a little nerve-wracking. But um, uh, So anyway, those are the kind of things that you need to consider that in a house or apartment you can kind of get away with a little bit or your apartment stuff or a house is set up to deal with the region you live in in an rv you're changing your region all the time and have to deal with you know you should have extra carpets extra protection um, things that might hurt your leolium floor you might want to protect them with a, a rug um, those are going to be a constant issue of uh, and if you have carpeting in your RV, um, depending on what region you're in, you may want to vacuum a little bit more. So, things to consider if you want to become an RVer, just how it is. The Dark, the dark side, side, side of RV. So, you're going to be an RVer and you're actually going to have a, a video um, or blog or keep up with that stuff. Well... Then you got to deal with equipment, and so uh, this could be the same scenario if you're an arts and craft kind of person. Let's say you're a quilter. Where are you going to do your quilting? Where are you going to keep your sewing machine? Keep your equipment and supporting stuff for that. Uh, what if you have different hobbies? Uh, maybe uh, you're a flint napper, or maybe you're you like to build birdhouses and stuff like that. Well. That's can I mean a lot of this stuff can be done, no problem, but there's give and take. Um, you know, having the right kind of tables, having an area in your RV that's devoted to your craft. Uh, poor Sherry has to deal with my podcast equipment. Uh, not to mention the seven or eight cameras that we deal with, keeping those stored. Of course, there's all the supporting equipment for that, tripods mono sticks um, different pieces of electronics like uh, we have a pan lapse kind of equipment for our time lapse cameras uh, lights uh, we have to have uh, studio lights in here once in a while when we're doing things uh, in the RV um, so it's just on and on supporting equipment so it could be a hobby or it could be if you're doing videos or podcasts lots of equipment and of course uh, so um, there's some hobbies that, uh, like Sherry and I, are, if you didn't know, we used to own kite shops back in the 90s and were kite flyers. Luckily, we were able to carry our kites with us. But um, some, you know, I don't have my fishing equipment with me. I do like to fly fish. That's all in storage. Uh, a lot of the things that, um, that are outdoing, backpacks and things like that, are all up in storage in Washington State. Uh, so there's a few things you might have to give up and put away for a while. I love the salmon fish, the equipment for salmon fishing, tackle boxes, nets, stuff like that. Uh, of course, we own a boat, so we probably have more than we know. Uh, crab pots, things like that, we still have in storage. So you may have to give up or hold off on some of your hobbies um, in order to do this lifestyle. Um, but maybe not. You just have to really weigh it out. What's your passion? So in our case, it's um, uh, our, doing our shows, the podcasts, and RV Travel Quest keeps us quite busy. And uh, we do have some of our hobby things with us, like our kites and things like that. And when we're talking about kites. We're talking about serious kites. We're on a kite team and actually competed all over the United States. So uh, we are very avid kite flyers and actually owned some kite shops back in the 90s. So Anyway, that was something that we enjoyed to do, and we pull out the kites once in a while just to terrorize the sky. But anyway, keep that in mind if you're going to be an RVer. Of course, the next question I would have for you is, how do you pay for your bills and stuff? Have you got yourself set up where you're getting to be more electronic? Because once you hit the road, you got to deal with the mail issue. And it's not that hard, really. Uh, for example, we're in Washington. We just went to an area that we like, went to a mailbox, etc. kind of place, uh, and set up a box. And basically uh, how that works is all of our mail, we diverted all of our um, 
mail to that and we try not to get a P.O. box. We actually got a place where it's got a regular address and a number and um, that opens the doors for a lot more things that you can, uh, our bank didn't have a problem with it, uh, all of our credit card, anything like that. Um, not a problem is changing the address to. Plus I got my retirement and pension and things like that. Um, retired from the company I'm at, you have to have a registered address with them. So all that mail goes to that box and basically we leave a deposit of, we left like $30 with them and so uh, once a month or so, because uh, we also have a business for hosting all of that and we send out invoices and in order to get the checks that come in, we have to request our mail. And so we call them up, we say, uh, can you bundle up our mail, please? Send it to blah, 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 Arizona or blah, 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 Central Oregon or wherever we're at. And we have our mail sent to us in bulk and then they just take from the $30 deposit we gave them until that runs out. Then we'll just give them you know, some more money for the, the pot. And so uh, they can pack up our mail and mail it to us and it's not been an issue whatsoever. Um, just things get delayed a little bit. So... Uh, you know, uh, you can't be in a hurry, but if you got bills and things like that that are critical through snail mail, uh, you need to fix that. You need to change it to electronic so you can pay your, uh, stay on top of important bills like that. But, you know, uh, our cars are registered in Washington. We're considered a Washington resident. Our tabs, things like that are going to go to that address. And it's important that you have a way to get to your mail on a regular basis. Uh, to take care of uh, stuff you just can't do electronically. But we're actually able to even do our um, tabs and stuff electron you know, electronically uh, through their website. So um, just hasn't been really a problem. And people worry about that, but just um, some people have a house and they want to still be able to get to the mail. Some post offices will hold your mail and do the same kind of program. We had something like that in Terrebonne, Oregon when we lived there where the little post office would hold our mail and forward it to us from there. So that was kind of slick. So anyway, mail is um, not a problem, but if you aren't used to that, it might panic you a little bit. You just got to change your process. Well, this is the doozy. You ready? Can you live with your spouse, if you have a spouse or partner, in close quarters <laughs> you go oh yeah no problem or no way but anyway uh, it's definitely an issue and even if you're good at it there's still times you have uh, challenging days and you know you got to deal with you know Sherry and I've been married forever and we knew each other forever so we've been married 36 years and we knew each other as kids and, and uh, even before we were married we were doing camping trips and all that stuff it's just the realism of being human is definitely a factor. In an RV, you're tested. Um, and I'll talk about the things that you probably never talk about, but the bathroom. Um, when you have to do your thing, um, even with all the fans and all that stuff, uh, it's just you're going to be sharing that a little bit. And uh, you just kind of tolerate it, maybe joke about it and make fun of each other. Uh, I don't care, boy or girl, it's an, you know, it's just going to happen that, the, you know, you just fumes get all over and, and you may have days of, uh, you guys had a great Mexican dinner and it's affecting you. Um, let's say if you could just utilize the gas from that and put it in your propane tanks, that'd be great, but it doesn't work that way. And if you uh, slip up and, uh, have one of them gaseous kind of days, the entire RV shares that. <laughs> And uh, not to mention, uh, dogs are really good at that too. And the cat litter box, uh, you know, she just has a glorious day in the uh, litter box and doesn't get it covered as well. It's like, all right, who died in here? So that's an issue is that bothers you and uh, you can't get over the human factor of your partner. Uh, could be a problem. My wife, you know, she, you know, after she takes a shower, she uses the bathroom a lot longer than I do. Um, maybe uses hairspray, things like that, perfumes. Um, those things uh, could probably could bother some people. It doesn't. That's just how it is. And uh, um, you know, so uh, 
us, <laughs> the close quarters is our king size bed, and having a chocolate lab sleeping in the middle uh, gets a little bit uh, challenging, but we wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, but, um, you know, wh who gets what chair, or if I'm working on a computer, and she, uh, if uh, hangout, so we occasionally will do hangouts or support a hangout, which is uh, basically what that is, is you get on the internet, and there's a team of people actually having a discussion on RVing uh, so I'll be devoted to the headset and a microphone and she'll very courteously well um, uh, which she still could stay in this room but she prefers to go in the back room I think she's afraid that I might pull her into the hangout but um, uh, you know it's challenging all the time and little things like she's in the kitchen and I want to get something out of the cupboard and or and I get her in her way and then so sometimes I need to wait hesitate wait my turn or warn her that is there a way I could get by you so I could grab uh, uh, some nuts out of the uh, the munch on or something or make a drink or something uh, you know you just communication is important too but it can be challenging some people just can't do it and uh, so you really need to consider uh, this lifestyle are you capable of living with your partner uh, that close all the time and uh, if luckily if some people are working um, that it's helpful you get some time away but I guess the best way is that you may live in a little house but you have a very big yard and so uh, getting out of the RV and just sitting outside and and feel like you're not claustrophobic and things and it's good for your pets too uh, make that a habit but uh, it can get on pe people's skin and some people can't tolerate you wonder you know they've been married for years but boy uh, they just are just um, tearing at each other uh, in close quarters and it's like you know everybody's different and so Sherry and I I guess are unique but we do have our times where sometimes I just she needs to go for a walk or I need to go for a walk or or we just both need to walk outside where we have some space because we have and we grew up as outdoorsy people so we feel the effects occasionally so yep need to consider that the dark side, the dark side of, of RV. RV another factor that actually I don't hear the RVers talk about it too much occasionally but uh, weather and driving in it so if you're going to be an RVer that is actually jaunting from one place to another uh, driving in some of these conditions and uh, can be really a problem Here's what I'm talking about. Um, if say down here in Arizona, um, one is you got to also be aware that heat is really tough on tires. So uh, you got to watch your running equipment. But here, wind is a problem and dust. So uh, certain areas are ideal for really strong gusts. Maybe you're going through a gully or something. And depending on what you're driving, uh, like a big motorhome is like a big sailboat. I tell you. I, I've had times I've been gusts when I had a 40-foot uh, fleet uh, Fleetwood Discovery. Uh, I had that thing hit hit some gusts where it literally pulled me over to the other side of the road. Um, um, dust storms. Um, if you're not used to that kind of stuff, like in the Northwest, you don't have dust storms. Uh, those are dangerous. You need to. It's like a whiteout condition if you're used, you know, in snow. So, and then of course you got the subject of snow, and then rain, and then uh, dark uh, rain, dark snow, uh, black ice, all those things. So, um, you know, you know how you feel driving in that stuff in a regular car. How are you gonna feel if you're driving an RV? Uh, some people are fine with it. Uh, I'm very me. I really hate snow. And with an RV, I will avoid it like the plague. Uh, I'm okay with gusts, um, but you know, you can get a. And, and I haven't been in all the different conditions. I've actually been in a whiteout condition once. That was the scariest thing I've ever been through. Uh, I've been in rain, that, especially, in, uh, in fact, it was in Arizona a few years back. The rain was coming down so hard that you just had to stop and just let it go through because the rain can really dump here. And of course, that happens in other states too. Like uh, I believe uh, Texas gets a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's another consideration for being an RVer, dark side of things, I guess. But uh, uh, 
weather conditions, I guess it does. You know, and if you're going to do a trip to like Alaska and stuff like that, you're going to be dealing with some um, uh, snow-covered roads and stuff. And so, uh, driving an RV, it's a real white knuckle situation. So, anyway, you need to. Um, and, and then there's the problem of hills and passes. Uh, making your uh, getting your equipment over that getting your engine to perform properly you'll be driving slower than others and have people that are impatiently behind you because there's no pacing uh, passing lane that you need to kind of shut it off and just maintain safety and so those are uh, things that come up in this world so especially uh, when you're driving an RV are you up for the challenge of actually traveling in an RV. Now here's the real challenge, navigating, <laughs> especially you and your partner or spouse. So, uh, and it can be even harder if you're alone, uh, which is a lot of RVers that are uh, by themselves. So, uh, you know, it's always important that you kind of uh, make sure that you look ahead of where you're going and uh, whether you're using uh, electronics or just re old fashioned maps. And of course, having a good navigation GPS system in your car helps too. So uh, I know, I don't know how some folks can deal with it, but uh, there's times even with all those electronics and Sherry runs, we will run a GPS, uh, Good Sam, uh, uh, Magellan system and she actually l prefers her cell phone in mo some cases and then works them both and it's amazing sometimes they both of those pieces of equipment don't agree with each other which is like really so you know Sherry's approach to something might be like you could have told me that sooner or we just missed the turn and he's like I thought you meant the next turn and it can be trying on your relationships, uh, especially navigating is is a pain. Uh, uh, and then, you know, I get a little stressed out in the big cities, like uh, trying to get through the freeways of Las Vegas. Uh, to me, even though I've done it before, it can be quite stressful. Uh, then there's places I've been stressed out getting them, and then I get there and it's not so bad. Uh, I would never want to take an RV through Seattle, but luckily I've lived there so I can get through it and I know when to go through it, but uh, navigating can be quite stressful and uh, there's ways to reduce that stress by good planning, good equipment, good uh, uh, communication between you and your partner, uh, but in some cases that's not the case and it could uh, it's kind of like owning a boat and trying to launch it at a boat launch. Uh, it's grounds for divorce sometimes. Uh, some partners, some um, spouses, you wonder how in the heck they stay married because they're just at each other's throat because uh, they're just not communicating with each other. And then there's like backing into RV parks, um, having a rear camera helps. Using a little walkie-talkie system tends to take a little bit of the stress. If you don't have walkie-talkies and you both have cell phones, call each other and talk to each other on your phone uh, when you're trying to back into a, a, a RV space. But yeah, that stuff can really be stressful and can really make you think twice about whether you're up for this RV stuff. And the last thing on my list I wanted to bring up real quick was cooking. One of the big things is uh, some of the cooking things that we had when we lived in a house or apartment, like big bread makers and things like that, were just not practical to bring on the RV. The other thing is we had to change the size of a lot of our pans, especially for the oven. Uh, little things for making um, a cookie, you had to get cookie sheets or smaller. Um, we had to put a pizza stone in our RV to uh, make the heat more consistent in our oven and we actually went with a 1 by 1 by 12 which is a pretty beefy one uh, we heard that the thinner ones uh, typically could crack and uh, we've had not had any trouble with the 1 by 1 any uh, you know, 1 by 1 1 inch uh, 12 by 12 something like that so anyway uh, also things like uh, little pans that we use to make uh, uh, meatloaf in or making uh, like lasagnas in and stuff that we had to make sure we had smaller pans to support that better 
So uh, cooking, uh, and then we've added on like a pressure cooker and some things that actually allow us uh, in a smaller size uh, rice cooker and things like that. So we had to actually downsize the appliances a, a tad to fit in the RV better. And, and not so much that you can't have them on the counter, but to be able to store them in your cupboards. So cooking can be an issue too, and that bothers you. You should uh, 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 just learn to adapt, or you may find that this might be just a little too tough to handle. And of course, dealing with refrigerators too, that's, uh, they're not typically the size you want them to be. And um, maintaining a refrigerator uh, that's uh, gas and electric doesn't work quite the same as the ones you had in your house or your apartment. So that kind of uh, covers my list. This is just a reminder that, first of all, <laughs> I'm done with my list. But two uh, is there's a lot of pros with RVing too. But uh, these are things to consider um, if you want to be in this RV lifestyle and find the balance that works good for you and maybe your spouse or partner. And so I want to take the time to thank everybody for listening to our show. It turned out to be a little bit long, but it is a podcast. And like I said, you can listen to it on your cell phone through a podcast so software. We are listed in iTunes and several other podcast directories. And um, just play the show out throughout the week. We come out every Monday. And uh, I just want to thank all of our listeners. We've had so many great listeners uh, and our show has been growing and growing and growing, and it seems to be at the appeal of, uh, of, and, and of most of our listeners. And if you have any suggestions or things you'd like us to talk about, we certainly will put them on the agenda. So I'm Rob Scribner from RV Talk Radio. Please take the time to subscribe to our show, share our shows. There is a video version of the show. And let people know we're out there. And if you get a chance to buy one of our stickers or maybe donate to the show, it, we consider that a tip. And we really do appreciate that. So once again, you guys, if you're going to be, become an RVer, these are things to consider. Uh, and don't let it hamper you as it is just an obstacle to get by. So thank you. Have a great day. Be safe out there. And we'll see you next Monday. Bye now.